Chapter 11, Single Case, Quasi-Experimental and Developmental Research. Disclaimer, the highlights we are going to talk about here will be to discuss the one group post-test only design and contrast that with the one group pre-test post-test design and what the problems and criticisms of using these designs can be. These criticisms have more to do with the internal validity of this study design then we'll go over the non-equivalent control group design and the variations of that design, but most importantly, the advantages of having a control group. The broader context here in this group of slides is that the idea of the quasi-experimental design being different from a true experimental design. In other words, the quasi-experimental design is only approximating an experiment but we're not going to be quite there because there is an essential element that is usually uh, part and parcel with an experimental design that will not be present in a quasi-experimental design or it might be ignored or lessened in some way. The thing to consider here is that there might be a really good reason why a researcher might want to use a quasi-experimental design over a true experiment, but the researcher will just have to acknowledge right out of the gate that there will be some more obvious criticisms and limitations to their ability to interpret the data because of those limitations. The simplest example of a quasi-experimental design is the one group post-test only design. If you take a look at the graphic here, it's a very simple. The example given in the text is that there will be just one group of participants, no control group, and this a group of participants will be asked to sit next to a stranger and then an observer or some other methodology of measuring uh, how long it will take for the stranger to get up and leave will be taken. But notice that there are a lot of things missing here. Obviously, like I mentioned, there's no control group, but also there is no clear manipulation of an independent variable. Also, there's no pretest. So basically the results might be interesting at face value, but there really isn't anything to compare them to. So this design is probably the weakest type of design because there's a lot of stuff missing here. Here we have an improved version of the previous design, and now we've included a pretest. So in this example, what we will have is only one group, and we will measure their smoking behaviors, then introduce a treatment then measure their smoking behaviors again. So the benefit here is that the outcome after the treatment can be compared to the same measure before the treatment was given. The limitation here again is that there is no control group. And like we mentioned in the previous set of slides, we would not be able to account for some type of placebo or expectancy effect. So even though this is an improvement over the last design, it's still limited in terms of interpretability of the data. Also, there's no clear manipulation of the independent variable. So let's move on to the next slide where we can talk about those limitations in a little bit more detail. Here are those limitations. First, the history effect. This refers to events that occur between the pretest and the post-test that can affect the outcome. The textbook gave the example that if participants in the study got, a, got smoking behaviors pretest, then got word on the news that a celebrity died from lung cancer before the post-test, we would have a hard time knowing the extent to which that knowledge might have an effect on the participants' behaviors on the post-test. So again, the history effect is when some other event happens during the course of the study that could potentially affect the outcome. Now this is similar to, but should not be confused with, the maturation effect. The maturation effect has more to do with longer term studies where we can expect a person to change over time. For example, people might develop more insight to their problems and might get better at coping with it, and that could interfere with how we measure long term treatment effects. Also, one of those limitations is the testing effect. We sometimes refer to this as a practice effect. In other words, sometimes the test itself, especially at pretest, can make a person more aware of themselves and more aware of what the study is examining, thereby affecting the outcome. To use the smoking example again, just having a person write down how much they've been smoking at pretest might serve as a wake up call to their own behaviors and this alone might affect the outcome. 
Next, instrument decay. This is when the way in which we are measuring a variable gets less sensitive over time. For example, if we use observers to watch and document other people's behaviors and the way that they do that changes over time. For example, if we have observers who are beginners at the start of the study and then over time they get more skilled at making their observations, this could potentially change how the data is recorded over time. Finally, regression to the mean. This one is a little harder to explain and if you notice in the textbook, it takes a lot longer, um, a lot more room in the text to explain that concept, but I'll try to give you an example here that might make sense. Most basketball players, and we're not talking about superstars like Kobe Bryant or LeBron or anybody like that, but just ordinary NBA players, they tend to have pretty ordinary statistics. Occasionally, they might have really good games where they score a lot of points, which makes them look really great, and it gets them some attention. But when you actually look at their season averages, they're usually pretty ordinary. Regression to the mean is a similar concept because it means that sometimes participants are selected for something because they have an extreme score on something. But in reality, if you look at their behavior over time, it's pretty average. If we have a study where there is a pretest post test design, these extreme scores can really mess up our statistics because mathematically they pull the entire group of scores or the distribution in weird directions and make researchers believe something about the findings that may not necessarily be true. I mentioned earlier, I think, that there are times when a quasi-experimental design makes sense to use. And please keep in mind that although some designs are stronger than others, it really depends on what the researcher is planning to study and whether a legit experiment is really workable or not. Sometimes it isn't workable, so a quasi-experimental design is as close as we can get. The bottom line is that no design is perfect and every design can be criticized in some way. In the previous slides, we went over some of these weaker designs and now we'll get into a few improved designs. Most of what we will be talking about here is what's referred to as non-equivalent control groups designs. What this means in plain language is that even though we have a control group, participants were not randomly assigned to the control group or the experimental group. There was some other basis for why participants were divided into these groups. Remember that random assignment into groups is an essential feature of experimental design. When researchers artificially place participants into groups in a non-random way, then we can say that the groups are non-equivalent because there was a selection difference, a difference between these two groups that made the researchers decide in some way which groups to place them in. Notice in this example, it's a really simple post-test only design. No pretest is given. Now notice in this slide, we took essentially the same design that we were just looking at in the previous slide and added a pretest. This is an improvement over the previous design because now we can compare the non-equivalent groups against each other which is a sort of limited comparison, but now we can also compare pretest to post-test, which as I mentioned in a previous group of slides is like measuring a participant against themselves, which is always going to be a stronger comparison. Still though, we don't have the benefit of random assignment, so there's still a selection bias or uh, at least some type of weakness overall here. In the previous slides, we mentioned the idea of matched pairs designs where we can match a participant with another participant on something like GPA or SAT scores or some other kind of variable, and then randomly assign them to groups and see how they differ, given that they might be identical or at least close to identical on some variable that we're interested in. A propensity score matching uh, design is similar to this idea. One of the cool developments that's come about is the ability to match participants on multiple variables all at once. And this would ordinarily be really complicated to do from a mathematics and statistics point of view, but new software packages exist that can do this for us now, so it makes it so much easier. Using this technique helps us to match participants that might exist in the control group with participants in the experimental group, and we can sort of mitigate or lessen the impact from a stats and math standpoint of the non-equivalent design to some degree.
The interrupted time series design is a tool to use when we want to look at a discrete period of time within a larger timeline. This means we need to have data from both before and after the time period we were interested in so that we had reference points. So let me give you a fake example. Let's say an elementary school was measuring how many kids were caught doing drugs at school in a time period from maybe 1990 to 1995. And then in 1995, there was a huge uptick and this got the school's attention. They were going to decide to have an intervention and the year after 1996 and throughout to the year 2000, the drug abuse numbers went back to normal. They could say that the intervention worked or did it, or was that just a really weird extreme year and the numbers would have gone back to average anyway, which is another way to say regression to the mean. We talked about that in a previous slide. We might never really know what happened here. The control series design is essentially similar to the interrupted uh, time series design, except this time there is a control group. This is where the name comes from. So now, instead of comparing the school's drug use and students year by year, they can also compare themselves to other schools in the same time frame and determine whether the numbers in 1995 were a fluke or perhaps an overall trend that occurred everywhere. This is obviously an improvement over the interrupted time series design. The take home message that you should be thinking about in all of these slides is that implementing a control group is significantly advantageous. Moving with the example uh, from the text, in this graphic, you can see the interrupted time series design with the example for traffic fatalities in Connecticut in the 1950s, where in 55, they thought this was worth cracking down on. And then the subsequent years, these numbers and traffic uh, fatalities went down. But was it because the crackdown occurred or was it because of regression to the mean? Let's see what happens when they add a control group. In this graphic, you can see how the same blue line represents those traffic fatalities in Connecticut in that same time frame as shown in the previous slide. Now we can also include the dotted line, which is the average traffic fatalities in the other comparable states or the control group. As you can see, the increase in 55 wasn't really that much higher than what other states were seeing. And overall, the trend of fatalities was lower than other states to begin with. So maybe the intervention worked, or maybe it was just a really weird year for Connecticut in 55, which could be an, uh, another way to say it was regression to the mean. We'll probably never know. But these are important concepts to understand in the bigger picture of non-experimental designs. And that's it. Thanks for paying attention and take care.